Alice sat on a bench in the hospital garden, unable to hold back her tears. It was the height of April, a wonderful time of year. Freshly sprouted leaves, gentle sunshine, a pleasant, light breeze filled with the scents of the warmed earth. Alice had always loved spring. She should have been out enjoying the beautiful weather, making plans for summer. But instead, she sat near the hospital building, weeping. Fortunately, she was alone, allowing her to freely express her emotions. Weston, her beloved husband, the man who understood and accepted her like no one else, was currently in the intensive care unit. Just six months ago, he was a strong, healthy man, as reliable as a rock. With him by her side, all problems seemed insignificant. Alice knew her husband would do anything for her. He gave her a sense of security and protection, cheered her up when she was sad, and always found the right words of encouragement when she needed them. Even now, lying in his hospital bed, he still tried to support Alice. We'll get through this, Weston said today when he noticed his wife was about to cry. Alice tried to stay strong. She couldn't let Weston waste his remaining strength on comforting her, but he saw right through her and understood all her feelings. We'll get through this, he said, but Alice knew better. Weston was only vaguely aware of the details of his diagnosis, but Alice was in constant contact with his doctor, Dr. Sanchez. Alice's parents used all their connections to ensure Weston received treatment from him. When they succeeded, it seemed the worst was over. Weston was in good hands. However, even the best doctors are not gods and cannot perform miracles, and a miracle was what Weston needed. It was painful for Alice to see her husband like this, pale, worn out, with dark circles under his eyes, his voice weak and barely audible, and his condition deteriorating every day. Initially, Alice hoped everything would work out, but now... Prepare yourselves, Dr. Sanchez had said a few days ago. The disease is progressing rapidly. The supportive therapy is becoming less effective, his vital signs are worsening, and there's still no response from the donor bank. The waiting lists there are enormous. Weston had never really visited doctors before. He had always been remarkably healthy since childhood, rarely catching even a cold or flu. He was tall, athletic, strong and resilient. Alice, looking at him with his thick blonde hair, wide white-toothed smile and beautiful clear skin, often thought about the wonderful children they would have. Weston had good genetics, though he never knew his parents. Michael grew up in an orphanage. When he was old enough to ask questions about his past, the caregivers initially brushed him off, but eventually one nurse enlightened him. He learned that his mother, a tall, once beautiful woman who had fallen into disarray, abandoned him at the maternity hospital. Apparently, she was a drinker with several young children at home and no husband, so she decided she couldn't afford another child and left him, hoping it was the best she could do for him. Weston was never adopted and grew up in the orphanage. He occasionally told Alice about his childhood, never feeling sorry for himself or complaining about his fate. It wasn't in his nature. He preferred to view life optimistically. Yet Alice understood that her beloved had a difficult childhood. The small details in his stories revealed the hardships, like the rare sweets shared among all the children in the orphanage or the harsh treatment from the caregivers. Despite growing up in such an environment, Weston turned out to be the kindest and most sensitive person Alice had ever met. They met by chance when Alice was in college. She and her friends from her class decided to celebrate the end of a challenging exam session at a bar to relax and have fun after their intense studies. Alice looked resplendent that day, aware of her captivating presence as evidenced by the admiring glances she received. The atmosphere was lively with dancing, laughter and jovial conversations, 
as well as the chance encounters with new acquaintances. While some of Alice's peers were invited to dance, Alice's experiences were mixed. The first man who approached her, lacking appeal and noticeably older, was politely declined by Alice. Following him was a young man, exuding arrogance, whose invitation to dance seemed more like a condescension than a gesture of interest. Preferring the company of her friends over such unwelcome advances, Alice stayed with them, though she couldn't deny a certain enjoyment in the male attention. As the evening neared its close, Alice, momentarily alone at the table, was approached by Weston. His casual attire, a grey t-shirt, well-worn jeans and sneakers, contrasted with his neat, tousled blonde hair and striking green eyes. His smile, enchanting yet tinged with shyness, sparked an immediate attraction in Alice. She greeted him with a smile, inviting him to join her. May I? he inquired, already taking a seat across from her. Of course, Alice responded, her smile unwavering. Alice, eschewing the typical coquettish games, found Weston's genuineness refreshing. His aura was unique, and she enjoyed his company without reservation. My name is Weston. May I know yours? he began, initiating a conversation that flowed with ease and familiarity. Alice, she responded, her honesty evident. Their dialogue was seamless, devoid of awkwardness or strain, as if a long-standing bond existed between them. When her friends returned, giggling and casting glances, Weston greeted them cordially, showing no undui interest in Piper's attention-grabbing attire. As a slow melody filled the air, Weston extended an invitation to dance. He was considerate and respectful, his presence radiating warmth and strength, creating a cocoon of comfort for Alice. In his embrace, she felt cherished and elegant, effortlessly following his lead. Despite knowing little of Weston's background or profession, Alice sensed his reliability and kindness. His departure to assist a friend, with a promise to return and a plea for her to wait, left Alice anticipating his return, hoping their newfound connection would continue to blossom. The evening unfolded with Alice's friends engaged in lively chatter, yet her mind lingered on Weston. His absence cast a shadow of longing and disappointment over her. As time passed without his return, Alice oscillated between worry and indignation, suspecting he might have found someone else. Their lack of exchanged contact details and unspoken promises did little to soothe her yearning heart. Did your admirer disappear? inquired Christine, her voice tinged with sympathy as she noticed the melancholy in Alice's eyes. You liked him, didn't you? Alice masked her feelings with a dismissive response. No, he wasn't anything special, just another guy. There's a million like him. Piper, aligning with Alice's feigned indifference, suggested, Right, there are plenty more out there, but you're unique. Let's hit the bar on Fifth Street. Things are winding down here, but the real party is just beginning there. Piper, the seasoned nightlife navigator of their group, proposed a new destination. The idea was met with enthusiasm by everyone except Alice, who clung to a faint hope of Weston's return. Reluctantly, she agreed, not wanting to dampen her friends' spirits or abandon them. As they arrived at the bar, the first person Alice saw, to her astonishment, was Weston. His unexpected presence seemed almost surreal. How did you find us? Piper asked, her vibrant personality shining through. Weston explained his efforts to locate them, revealing a level of dedication that deeply touched Alice. It was a gesture straight out of a romantic film, something she had never experienced before. So, are you joining us at the bar? Piper inquired, seeking clarity. Weston's gaze turned to Alice, silently seeking her preference. Let's take a walk instead, Alice suggested, her voice soft yet certain. 
Weston's smile brightened at her proposal, and her friends exchanged knowing glances. As you wish, Christine said, the voice of responsibility in the group. Just text me when you get home, okay? Her request, made in front of Weston, subtly underscored her concern for Alice's safety. Alice and Weston meandered through the nocturnal cityscape, their hands intertwined. Their conversation ebbed and flowed effortlessly, punctuated at times by comfortable silences. As they approached Alice's home, Weston's kiss left her head spinning, a culmination of her long-held desire. His hesitancy had been evident, as if he feared rushing or overwhelming her, but in that moment, all reservations seemed to melt away under the starlit sky. They began dating. Some details of his life initially shocked her, but the fact that he grew up without parents actually made him stronger. Weston understood that his only hope was in education. Seeing his diligence, teachers helped and guided him, giving him extra attention. He was especially grateful to his physics teacher and dreamed of becoming wealthy and famous to thank this caring educator someday. With his excellent grades, Weston easily got into a prestigious college and quickly became one of the best students. During this time, he also started taking on odd jobs. Weston was the same age as Alice, but his life experiences and knowledge about the world made him seem more mature to her. Alice, still financially supported by her parents, felt like a little girl compared to him. Weston, kind and sensitive, craved love and acceptance. Alice sensed this. He had missed out on attention in his childhood and now valued sincere feelings and kindness. She was grateful for their chance meeting at the bar. Upon her university graduation, Alice was joyfully surprised by Weston's proposal. Their relationship had already blossomed in the warmth of her family's acceptance. Her mother often expressed her fondness for Weston, empathizing with his challenging past and hoping for his bright future. Such a handsome and good-hearted young man with a tough fate, she would say, optimistic for his well-being. Alice's father saw in Weston a mature, determined individual. He's not just a boy, but a real man. Young, yet with clear ambitions. He's destined need for great things. Their wedding funded by Weston's prudent savings was a splendid affair. The newlyweds began their life together in Weston's apartment. Alice, sheltered and inexperienced in domestic tasks, was met with patience and guidance from Weston. He took on many household responsibilities, demonstrating his adeptness, from which Alice eagerly learned. She had grown up with her mother ruling the kitchen and never realized the creative joy in cooking until now. Weston's encouragement, even when her culinary attempts faltered, was a testament to their harmonious life filled with dreams of a bigger home, travels, and a large, loving family. Weston, who had longed for family warmth, would playfully ask, do you mind being the mother of many? Maybe five or six kids? Alice would respond with a laugh, that's too few. I dream of ten. Can you handle us? I'll move mountains for our family, Weston would reply with determination. Yet, as years passed, their hope for a child remained unfulfilled. While Alice's friends celebrated their pregnancies and motherhood, she felt a mix of joy for them and a growing sense of personal loss. Recognizing Alice's distress, Weston suggested medical consultation. The results revealed that while Weston was healthy, Alice faced significant fertility challenges. Devastated, she found solace in Weston's comforting embrace. Don't lose hope, Weston encouraged. The doctor mentioned IVF, and there's always the option of adoption. I long for a child that resembles you, Alice cried. To me, a child is a child, regardless, Weston reassured her, emphasizing their bond over biology. Despite their resilience, 
the IVF journey was a roller coaster of hope and heartache. After two unsuccessful attempts, they braced themselves for another round, clinging to hope amidst the emotional turbulence. Alice's health suffered due to the endless medical procedures, but she was determined to achieve her goal. Enough, Weston said softly yet firmly one day. This happened after another unsuccessful attempt at IVF. What do you mean, enough? Alice didn't understand. We need to stop harming your health. You need a break from all this, Weston explained. How so? Alice was still puzzled. Simple. Stop taking these pills. Let's just live, enjoy life and each other without a worry, Weston suggested. Alice, too, was tired of the endless hopes, worries, medical procedures and tests. What about having a child? You always dreamed of a big family, she asked. I dream more of a happy life with my loved one. I want you to be happy. But you're exhausting yourself with all this. It's time to stop, Weston said. What about children? Alice persisted. We can always adopt a child from the orphanage, her husband replied. But I want my own children, Weston. Who knows where those children came from? Alice blurted out. What about me? I'm from an orphanage too, Weston reminded her. Fine, if you don't want someone else's child, I won't insist. But I won't let you harm yourself any more either. Weston seemed to lift the responsibility for their future family off her, taking it all on himself, and so it was in everything. Alice trusted him more than anyone. Weston was her protector, guardian, provider. She thought it would always be so, but things turned out differently. It all started when Weston, a man always full of strength and energy, began to tire easily. He would come home from work and go straight to bed, to the TV. For most people, this was nothing unusual, but not for Weston. He was always bursting with energy. After work, he would fix things or take Alice for a walk. Weston was always busy, hating idleness and laziness. Then he began to tire even more. He would come home from work, pale, panting, utterly exhausted. His appetite worsened. He lost weight quickly, and then bruises began appearing on his body without any apparent reason. You need to see a doctor, Alice insisted. I've already made an appointment with a therapist. Don't you dare miss it. Thank you, Weston smiled. I was planning to go soon. Alice was worried about her husband, but was sure nothing serious was happening. She thought the doctors would diagnose some vitamin deficiency prescribe vitamins, regular walks. Maybe they would go to the sea, rest, and everything would be fine. But they weren't prepared for the diagnosis. It turned out Weston had a rare autoimmune blood disease. His strong body was destroying itself. The worst part was that there was no cure. Weston was prescribed treatment, but the doctor wanted that the results would be weak and temporary. He needed further examination. Their young family's life changed drastically. All plans, hopes and dreams suddenly became distant and unimportant. Even the inability to become parents now seemed less catastrophic. Alice's parents were horrified by their son-in-law's diagnosis. Her father pulled every string he could and managed to get Weston under the care of Dr. Sanchez. Alice thought that now Weston would surely be cured she even cried with relief when her father called with the good news. But it was soon clear that it was too early to rejoice. Weston's condition worsened. He was constantly on sick leave, spending all day at home. He had so little strength that he couldn't even reach his computer or workspace. But Weston remained optimistic, always trying to joke, even about his condition. Don't worry so much. I hardly ever got sick as a child. I have a strong immune system. I'll get through this, he said. That's the problem, your strong immune system. It's actually working against you, Alice sighed. Soon, the disease intensified. 
Weston was hospitalized. Alice wept in their empty apartment in the evenings. Her parents suggested she move in with them temporarily, but she refused. She slept on Weston's side of the bed, covered with his blanket, wore his clothes around the house, and cried a lot. She didn't want her parents to see her in such a state. Weston's condition rapidly deteriorated to the point where he couldn't get out of bed. A bone marrow transplant was the only thing that could save him, a complex and costly operation. Money wasn't a problem, as Weston had managed to save a substantial amount but finding a suitable donor was challenging, almost impossible at that time. When the operation was first discussed, Dr. Sanchez immediately requested compatibility tests from all of Weston's blood relatives. The chances of finding a donor among relatives are high. A brother, sister, parents, if they are still alive, the professor said. Weston is from an orphanage, Alice said with a fallen voice. He doesn't know anything about his relatives. At that moment, Alice desperately regretted that they had not been able to have their own child. Perhaps a son or daughter could have been the salvation for Weston. The search for a donor progressed very slowly. There were several candidates ready to save a stranger, but none were a match. Hope was dwindling. Alice wiped her eyes and looked around. The hospital square was empty. Tears brought temporary relief. She was about to leave. She still had to get home through the evening traffic. Poor Weston, a woman's voice sounded just around the corner of the building. Alice stopped. Somehow, she immediately knew they were talking about her husband. She cautiously peered around the corner. Two hospital employees were sitting on a bench. Alice recognised them. She often saw them on the floor where Weston's ward was middle-aged women, they enjoyed a break amid a tough shift, as both had clearly demanding jobs. Absolutely, I feel bad for him, the second woman agreed. He's a good, kind young man, but it's clear he won't be around much longer. He's getting weaker every day. Alice's eyes filled with tears again. She was so close to bursting out of her hiding spot and telling these women off for giving up on her dear one so easily. She leaned on the wall for support, her head spinning. That evening, when Alice returned home, she was completely worn out. She went to bed and, for the first time in ages, fell into a deep, restful sleep. She had a dream so vivid that when she woke up, she wished she could return to it. In the dream, they lived in a snug, charming house in a quaint little town. In her dream, Alice strolled through a lush green meadow in a pretty summer dress, carrying a basket filled with bread, butter and fruit. Far off, she saw Weston working in a field, gathering hay. Then, she heard a young child's voice behind her. Mommy, wait for me! A six-year-old girl came running out of the house towards Alice, giggling. She wore a hat and a summer dress, her chestnut-coloured hair bouncing as she dashed across the field. Weston appeared, playfully chasing her. The girl laughed louder and sped up. Alice opened her arms wide, calling for her to hurry. The girl ran into Alice's embrace. Weston caught up, trying to lift them both, but he tripped, and they all tumbled onto the grass, laughing. It was such a delightful dream that Alice didn't want to leave it, but she had gotten the rest she needed, so she woke up. For the first time since learning of her beloved's grave illness, Alice felt a renewed energy. The dream had lifted her spirits, if only for a moment. She grabbed some fruit and went to visit Weston, who was now too weak to sit up in bed. Yet, he still managed to greet her with a smile and a wink. You look especially bright today, Weston noted gazing at his wife. I'm just in a better mood, Alice responded, sitting next to him and gently holding his hand, which he weakly squeezed in response. She was eager to share her dream with him, but worried it might be too overwhelming, so she decided against it. As Weston drifted into sleep, Alice continued to hold his hand, gazing at his peaceful face, 
while tears silently streamed down her cheeks. Leaving the hospital around noon, Alice felt a need to take a walk and breathe some fresh air. As she wandered, her thoughts turned to the uncertain future and the painful realisation that she might never have children with her husband. She recalled their past discussions about trying to conceive and her offhand comment about children in orphanages. Abruptly, she stopped, struck by a sudden idea. A sense of purpose washed over her. Quickly, she walked back to her car and drove home. Once there, she immediately started contacting various children's homes, explaining her urgent situation. While there weren't many homes nearby, one of them invited her for an interview. Alice arrived at the children's home late, long after the children had gone to bed. She didn't get the chance to meet any of them. The staff members explained to her that the adoption process was typically lengthy, often taking several months, if not years. Alice expressed her readiness to adopt any child, emphasizing her desire to become a mother and for her husband to experience fatherhood, even if it might be for a short time. The staff, understanding her unique situation, agreed to expedite the process since she had no specific preferences for a child. However, they cautioned that it would still take a couple of months at the least. Alice accepted these terms. While walking through the hall, she noticed that the children had woken up and were playing outside. Her heart warmed at the sight of the kids, but as she approached the gate, her eyes locked onto one particular girl. The girl bore a striking resemblance to the child Alice had seen in her dream, which left her momentarily stunned and filled with an inexplicable chill. Beatrice, the manager of the children's home, noticed Alice's intense gaze and asked, Is everything okay, Alice? Alice, still reeling from the shock, struggled to find words. She looked at Beatrice, almost not comprehending the question. Oh, yes, everything's fine, she finally replied. May I go and talk to that little girl over there? she asked, pointing towards the child. Beatrice, with a warm smile, nodded in agreement. Alice made her way towards the girl, who was deeply engrossed in playing with her dolls. As she got closer, the girl looked up and greeted Alice with a smile. Alice returned the smile and complimented her on the dolls. Hi there, sweetie. I love your dolls, Alice said kindly. The girl, beaming, eagerly began to tell Alice about each of her dolls and the story she had imagined for them, including one where a doll felt sad because her friend was leaving. Beatrice, the manager, came over and shared the girl's background with Alice. This is Emery. Her mother struggled with alcohol and drug addiction, so Emery has been with us for some time. Often people hesitate to adopt children with parents who had substance issues, she explained. Alice learned that Emery had seen many children come and go, but no one seemed to want to adopt her. Emery's sadness wasn't rooted in her own situation, but in the departure of her friends. This revelation deeply touched Alice, and it was clear to Beatrice what Alice was thinking. The manager assured her that they would do everything possible to expedite the adoption process. In the days that followed, time seemed to drag for Alice. She eagerly awaited the call that would change her life, all the while imagining the moment she would surprise Weston. Finally, the long-awaited call came. Beatrice invited Alice over to the children's home. Filled with excitement, Alice picked up some flowers and a new doll for Emery and drove to the home, her heart racing with anticipation and joy. As Alice stepped into the bright and welcoming building, her eyes instantly found Emery, who was sitting quietly in a corner with her hands gently clasped together. Emery looked up, her bright eyes filled with a mix of curiosity and caution. Her curly chestnut hair framed her face in soft ringlets, and she wore a small, hesitant smile that seemed to carry months of longing and hope. 
Alice crouched down to Emery's level, offering her a warm, friendly smile. Hi, Emery, she spoke softly. I've really missed you, sweetie. Do you remember who I am? She asked gently. Emery gave a slow nod in response. Alice continued, How would you like to come with me? We could go to the park, or maybe get some ice cream on our way home. What do you think? At the mention of ice cream, Emery's eyes sparkled with happiness, a sign of joy understood by children everywhere. She nodded timidly, her smile gaining a bit more confidence. Alice held out her hand, and after a brief moment, Emery's small hand slipped into hers, symbolizing a quiet trust that was forming between them. As they left the orphanage, Alice felt Emery's grip tighten a bit, a silent sign of her excitement mixed with nervousness about the new life ahead. Alice sensed the start of a significant journey, not only for Emery, but for herself and Weston too. Alice gently explained to Emery that she could choose to call her mom or simply Alice. It was entirely up to her. Emery responded with a smile, yet remained silent. Alice had previously spoken to Emery about Weston, so she was aware that her new dad was unwell. During their drive to the hospital, Alice and Emery chatted about various things. In just an hour, Alice felt as if she had been Emery's mother since her birth. Their conversation was effortless and natural, deepening the bond between them. Arriving at the hospital, Alice entered Weston's room with her heart racing, a blend of nervousness and hope pulsating through her. Clutching Emery's hand gently, she walked towards Weston's bed. He lay there, weakened, but as he opened his eyes and saw Alice and the young girl, his expression turned to one of confusion. Alice, who is this? Weston asked, his voice weak but laced with curiosity. Taking a deep breath and with emotions flickering in her eyes, Alice introduced them. Weston, this is Emery, our daughter. Emery, meet Weston, your dad, she said. A look of surprise crossed Weston's face as he shifted his gaze between Alice and Emery, who stood by shyly, yet with a glimmer of hope in her eyes. The room was silent for a moment, filled with astonishment and uncertainty. Then, Weston's face softened as he looked at Emery. Hello, Emery, he said kindly. It's very nice to meet you. Emery, feeling the warmth in Weston's voice, smiled faintly and waved. Hi, she replied in a small voice. Weston turned back to Alice, his eyes brimming with tears, a blend of gratitude and amazement evident in his gaze. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for bringing Emery he whispered. As Weston and Emery began to tentatively converse, Alice observed them, her heart swelling with a complex mix of feelings. Watching the beginnings of a bond between her husband and their new daughter, she felt a cautious hope for what lay ahead. Later that day, as they drove home, Emery was unusually quiet. Concerned, Alice asked if she was all right. After a pause, Emery finally spoke. His name's Michael, she whispered. Confused, Alice asked. What, sweetie? Who's Michael? The man at the hospital. Weston. His name's Michael, Emery repeated, her eyes welling up with tears. Baffled and concerned, Alice pulled the car over to the side of the road to fully grasp what Emery was revealing. Alice gently explained to Emery, that's Weston, my husband, and your dad. But he looks like Michael, Uncle Michael, Emery replied. This revelation startled Alice, filling her mind with a whirlwind of thoughts. Once they reached home, she showed Emery around the house, and then they settled down. Alice cautiously tried to ask about Uncle Michael, but noticing Emery's discomfort, she quickly changed the subject. That evening, she prepared a special dinner for Emery and tucked her into bed. Unable to shake her curiosity, Alice, despite the late hour, called Beatrice, the manager of the children's home. 
Beatrice had limited information about Emery's background, only knowing that her parents struggled with alcoholism and that she was brought in by a neighbor or someone similar. Alice inquired about getting contact details or an address for this Michael. The next day, Alice drove to a small town a few hours away. She arrived at the given address to find an overgrown yard and a makeshift dump nearby. She cautiously rang the doorbell, but there was no answer. With some hesitation, she pushed open the gatey and approached the porch. The front door was unlocked. She knocked lewdly and a voice from inside responded, Come in. Can't you see the door is open? Expecting the homeowner to be waiting for a guest, Alice entered. The house had a musty, old smell and the furniture was worn and damaged. Random items littered the room, a shaggy doll with a face marked in blue ink, swollen, yellowed books, an old cassette player. Despite the dilapidated surroundings, the kitchen had a pleasant aroma of fried potatoes and onions, a stark contrast to the rest of the house. Then, a man appeared in the hallway. When she laid eyes on the man's face, her breath caught in surprise. He had the exact same features as her husband, Weston. Identical eyes, cheekbones, the curve of the eyebrows, hairline, and even a mole on his neck. The resemblance was uncanny, yet there were differences. This man's lifestyle seemed harsher. His eyes were bloodshot, wrinkles etched deeply into his skin, and his face sported rough, untrimmed stubble. His clothes mirrored his rugged appearance, baggy track pants worn at the knees and a faded, loose tank top. Who are you? The homeowner inquired, his tone not accusatory or threatening, merely curious. Alice hesitated. I'm not sure where to start. Maybe it would help to see a photo of my husband first. The man gave a non-committal shrug and stepped closer. The resemblance to Weston was even more striking up close. Alice found herself staring, captivated. You seem straightforward. Can you just tell me what's going on? He asked bluntly. It's quite a long and complex tale, Alice replied with a smile. Well, let's talk over some potatoes in the kitchen then, he suggested. He welcomed her into his home as if she were a neighbor or a long-lost friend. Seated on a kitchen stool, Alice began recounting her story. Initially, she was nervous, her words faltering. But the man, Michael, listened with focused attention, not interrupting or querying. His expression stayed neutral, but Alice could see her words were affecting him profoundly. Concluding her story, she paused before saying, Looking at you now, I doubt we even need a DNA test. You and my husband are incredibly alike. Michael carefully examined the photos on Alice's phone, his hands quivering slightly, though his expression remained stoic. Did you know you had a brother? Alice asked, her voice laced with hope that this man was indeed Weston's kin, potentially holding the key to saving him from a fatal illness. I did. Michael replied, nodding slowly. His eyes shimmered with unshed tears, and his voice cracked as he spoke. But I never imagined I would find him. Michael paused for a moment to compose himself and started telling his story. At the time of those fateful events, he was barely eight years old. But he was already the only man in the family, constantly reminded of it by his stepsisters. The girls exploited him, making him clean and even making him cook when he was five or six. There was no father in the family. Their mother, Madeline, probably didn't even remember who fathered whom. She had many lovers. Life was hard for Michael in such an environment with his perpetually drunk and overly cheerful mother, the constant crowds of her guests and the oppression from older sisters. Later on, the girls followed in their mother's footsteps. What else to expect from girls raised in such a family? I wanted to run away, Michael confessed. I was only eight, but I remember it well. I thought about building a hut in the forest, living there in peace, 
surviving on berries and mushrooms just to be away from them all. Then it turned out that their mother was expecting another child. The children usually learned about the upcoming addition by noticing Madeline's belly. Where will we find room for another mouth? Madeline would lament, sitting in the kitchen with a cigarette. We're cramped as it is, and now another dependent has appeared. One thing if they paid good welfare for these brats. It might have been worth the suffering. But it's just pennies. I won't pick up the newborn from the maternity hospital. I'll just write a refusal and be done with it, the irresponsible mother concluded. The thought of a tiny baby being left somewhere terrified Michael. He was somehow sure that this time his mother would give birth to a brother. A boy growing up among sisters, he longed for this. He would teach his brother all kinds of manly things. Fishing, carving figures from wood with a knife, climbing trees. They would understand each other like no one else. Michael wouldn't feel that aching loneliness in a house filled with people anymore. Mom, don't leave the baby, please, Michael pleaded almost every day. If Madeline was in a good mood, she laughed and joked at that. If she was in a bad one, she could smack him for his persistence. After the due time, Madeline returned home thinner, fresher, after a week without alcohol and with utterly empty hands. Michael looked at his mother and felt tears boiling in his eyes. She left his brother after all. The little boy was going to be sent to an orphanage or to some good people, never knowing he had a brother who had dreamed of him and awaited him so eagerly. Michael cried then out of pain, despair, and the inability to change anything. Years passed. Madeline lost her parental rights, and the children were sent to different orphanages. Michael liked the orphanage. Clean bedding, good food, adult care. Time went by. Michael left the orphanage. His mother had passed away by then. All of his sisters were everywhere. He returned to their old, partially dilapidated house that stood empty. Michael earnestly tried to build a new life but failed. He couldn't find a job due to lack of education. He started doing odd jobs around the village, weeding gardens, chopping wood. Alice listened intently as Michael shared his heart-wrenching story, her eyes brimming with tears. She felt deeply moved by the struggles Michael had endured. Yet, Michael was unaware of the pivotal role Emery played in bringing everyone back together. A secret Alice was about to disclose. Alice gently started. I'm here because of Emery, someone you're familiar with. Michael's eyes widened in anticipation, urging Alice to reveal more about Emery. He seemed eager and hopeful. Alice continued. Weston and I always wanted children, but we couldn't have our own. So, we chose to adopt a child. As she spoke, Michael gradually began to understand the situation, tears streaming down his face. He was overwhelmed to learn that Emery, after all the hardship, had found a loving home. Giving Michael a moment to process his emotions, Alice waited until he regained his composure. Then, Michael shared his own story, filled with pain and challenges. My mother had many children, and over time, they all went their separate ways. I had no idea where they ended up, Michael explained. Four years back, Daisy, who was so much like our mother, came into my life unexpectedly. She loved to drink and party. Emery was just two years old then, and Daisy clearly had no interest in caring for her. I suspected Daisy planned to leave Emery with me and disappear, which she eventually did, probably eloping with her boyfriend. I tried my best to look after Emery. Tears flowed more freely from Michael as he spoke. I felt so sorry for Emery. Taking her into my care was the only choice I had, but I was never confident about being a good parent. I feared I couldn't provide her with the future she deserved. So, when she was four and a half, I made the tough decision to leave her at a children's home, hoping she would find a better life with someone else. 
What Michael didn't realize was his humility overshadowed the incredible care and love he provided Emery. Emery had grown very fond of Michael and loved him dearly. Despite his love for her, Michael doubted his ability to be a positive role model, especially because of his drinking habits. He worried this might adversely affect her future. Emery, still just a child, did not want to stay in the children's home. The decision to leave her there was agonizing for Michael, but he felt it was necessary for her better future. He hoped a loving family would take her in and provide a nurturing environment. To lessen Emery's attachment to him, Michael pretended to be angry, a facade that tore at his heart. Alice, deeply moved by Michael's story, gently stood up, took his hand, and embraced him in a comforting hug. You did an amazing job, Michael. Emery is a wonderful child, and she's going to be our daughter, all thanks to your care, Alice reassured him, her voice soft and eyes teary as she pulled away to meet his gaze. As they regained composure, Michael inquired about Weston. Tell me more about him. I've always dreamed of meeting my little brother, but never thought it would happen, he said eagerly. Alice spoke warmly and proudly of Weston, her affection for him evident. Michael listened intently, absorbing every detail about the brother he had longed to meet. Alice then shared that Weston was battling a serious illness. What can I do to help him? Michael asked earnestly. Alice's response, filled with a mix of sorrow and hope, caught Michael off guard. You can do a lot for him. In fact, you could save his life, she said. She explained the situation and the urgent need for a procedure. When can I meet him? Michael asked, eager to help. As soon as tomorrow. The procedure needs a sibling to be a suitable donor. I hope that's okay with you, Alice said, hope shining in her eyes. Absolutely, Michael responded without hesitation. I just hope I'm a suitable match. Alice, overwhelmed with gratitude, took Michael to the laboratory for the necessary tests for the complex procedure. Once completed, Michael eagerly asked if he could finally meet his brother. He spoke the word brother with a warmth and hope that resonated deeply, reflecting the emotional journey he was on. That morning, Weston felt somewhat better thanks to his new life-sustaining medications. His face lit up with a smile as he saw his wife. Hey baby, you're here early today, Weston greeted Alice. Weston, I have some incredible news for us. I don't even know how to begin, Alice replied, her voice carrying a soft melody of hope. There's someone here who wants to meet you. Michael stood hesitantly at the doorway, his heart racing with a mixture of excitement and nervousness, a lifetime of unspoken questions visible in his eyes. Hello, Weston, Michael started, his voice shaking with a mix of emotions. I'm Michael, your brother. The room fell into a profound silence, heavy with years of untold stories and emotions. Weston turned towards Michael, their eyes meeting in a moment, filled with a complex tapestry of feelings. My brother, Weston uttered in a whisper, a blend of disbelief and wonder in his voice. I never knew. I've always felt there was someone else out there, Michael said, his voice mixing regret with joy. I've spent my life wondering who you were, and now, here we are. The brothers' eyes remained locked, forming a silent connection over their shared heritage and years of separation. Weston's eyes, glistening with tears, conveyed a depth of emotion beyond words, shock, curiosity, and a newfound sense of connection swirled within him. All these years, he murmured softly, I thought I was alone, with no one else in the world. Slowly, Weston reached out, his hand trembling as he closed the distance of a lifetime. He gently embraced Michael, who whispered reassuringly, You're not alone anymore. I'm here now. We've lost a lot of time, but I'm here. 
Weston returned the embrace, a silent exchange of stories, sorrows and hopes passing between them. Alice quietly stepped out into the corridor, leaving them to bond. She understood that they needed this private moment to talk and learn more about each other. In giving them this space, Alice showed her respect and support for their newfound connection. Alice returned and they spent a long time chatting. Alice expressed her desire to have children, fulfilling her and Weston's dreams. She recalled the day before she decided to adopt and how Emery brought everyone together. Weston was amazed by these stories and they all felt joy in that moment. After leaving the hospital, Alice mentioned picking up Emery from school. She headed to her car, expecting Michael to follow, but he hesitated, troubled by his past actions. Michael regretted leaving Emery at the children's home and wished she could forget that painful time. Alice approached him with a smile, understanding his feelings. She reassured him, saying his decision, though hard, led to their current happiness. Michael pondered Alice's words, hoping Emery would forgive him. At the school, Michael's heart pounded as he saw Emery, now nine, leaving school. She was no longer the toddler he remembered. Overwhelmed, he called out to her. Emery, recognising him, asked in a mix of emotions, Uncle Michael? Michael tearfully apologised, explaining his decision was meant to be best for her. Emery, understanding, began to cry, releasing years of built-up emotions. For the first time since their separation, they shared a deep emotional connection, reflecting their shared pain and longing for reconciliation. Three days later, Alice couldn't contain her joy. She was leaping on the living room sofa, her laughter echoing through the house. He's a match! He's a match! She sang, twirling around with an energy that made the curtains flutter. Dr. Sanchez had called that morning with exhilarating news. Alice, I have fantastic news. Michael is a perfect donor match for Weston. The surgery that followed was complex and tense, but ultimately successful. During the weeks Weston spent in the hospital, Michael became a regular visitor. Each time he came, he brought a little piece of the forest with him, wild berries, earthy mushrooms, and stories that made Weston's sterile hospital room feel alive. Where did you find these? Weston asked one day, holding a particularly large mushroom with fascination. Ah, just a little secret spot, I know, Michael replied, his eyes twinkling with a sense of mystery. Nature's treasures, just for you. Weston's recovery at home was gradual but steady. Michael's visits were a highlight, not just for the gifts, but for his presence. They often sat together talking about everything and nothing. I owe you my life, Mike, Weston said on one such evening, his voice heavy with emotion. Michael shook his head, a gentle smile on his face. You don't owe me anything, Wes. This is what family does. As Weston regained his strength, one of his first goals was to help Michael move closer. Alice, always the pragmatic one, suggested, why don't we look for a larger house, one that fits all of us comfortably? The idea blossomed into reality and soon they were living under one roof. Alice took to her role as a mother with a natural grace, nurturing Emery with a love that was palpable. What do you think of this dress, Emery? She would ask, holding up colourful outfits that always brought a bright smile to Emery's face. Weston, too, found joy in spending time with Emery, often helping her with homework or taking her to the park. Ready to conquer those roller skates? He'd ask and her enthusiastic nods were all the answer he needed. When Weston helped Michael land a job at his company, it was clear that Michael's technical prowess was a hidden gem. You're a natural, Mike, Weston said, clapping him on the back after a particularly successful project. Living together brought a rhythm to their lives, a harmony that resonated with love 
and mutual support. Michael, once longing for a sense of belonging, found it in this family. I never knew a family could be like this, he said one evening, as they all sat in the living room, a patchwork of laughter and shared stories. Family is what you make it, Alice replied, her hand reaching out to hold his, and we've made something beautiful. After Weston had fully recovered, their lives blossomed with shared adventures. They bonded over fishing trips where the water glistened under the sun and hunting excursions through the rustling, vibrant forest. Their laughter and stories filled the air, weaving a tapestry of joyous memories. Six months into this new chapter, a delightful surprise awaited Michael. One evening, as he stepped out of his office, he found Weston, Alice and Emery waiting with beaming smiles. We're going on a little trip, Alice announced, her eyes sparkling with mystery. As they drove out of town, Michael's curiosity turned to unease. We're not going where I think we are, are we? He asked, glimpsing familiar landmarks leading to his old town. Don't worry, Weston reassured him, placing a comforting hand on his shoulder. Arriving at his old neighborhood, Michael braced himself for a sight of neglect. Instead, his eyes widened in disbelief. Before him stood his family home, but not as he remembered it. It was completely transformed, its walls freshly painted, the garden blooming with vibrant flowers. Alice and Weston shared a look of pride and excitement. We couldn't let you sell this place, Alice said gently, especially after learning why you wanted to. Michael stepped inside, each room revealing careful touches of love and thoughtfulness. The living room, once dull and lifeless, now radiated warmth with comfortable furniture and framed pictures that captured moments of their newfound family life. I can't believe this, Michael's voice trailed off, his heart swelling with a mix of emotions. Memories of his past, once tinged with sorrow, now seemed to blend seamlessly with a sense of hope and belonging. Tears, a blend of gratitude and joy, rolled down his cheeks. That evening, they gathered around a table adorned with a homemade feast, the house echoing with their laughter and stories. They decided then and there to make this a new tradition, returning to the house on weekends and holidays, to continue building their shared future in this place that symbolized their renewed bonds and collective dreams. As winter approached, they celebrated their first Christmas in the renovated house. The tree, adorned with lights and handmade ornaments, stood as a symbol of their shared journey. Gifts were exchanged, but the greatest gift they cherished was their togetherness. The story of Weston, Michael, Alice and Emery became one of hope, love and transformation. Their lives, once separate and filled with individual challenges, had woven together to form a tapestry rich with colour and warmth. In the end, they realised that family isn't just about blood relations, it's about who you choose to love and who chooses to love you back.